place to start is just asking where you got started. Um, so for those who don't know, these are photographs largely of yourself and your family. And these are props and costumes largely created by you, uh, some of them incredibly meticulously. How did you get started with this kind of stage photography of, you know, friends and family with these pop culture subjects? I went to undergrad at BYU, and at the time I was in the art program, and I was primarily painting and making comics, but I took a photo class and ended up having a lot of fun. I, the, the first photos I started making were started being costumes and backgrounds were uh, First one I made, I just got like a bunch of tin foil and taped it together and cut out a little mouth hole and hung up some streamers behind it and that was that. But I guess what drew me in was that I started with a drawing and was able to make that drawing into a photograph and I really enjoyed that transformation that it took on and that it was a costume in real life. It wasn't just, you know, on the paper in my mind, I guess. And so that's kind of where it first started, I guess. And, and I'll just follow up on the second part of that. How did you, why did you come to, you know, Batman and demons and angels? Like, <laughs> where did you, where did you think of your subject? Or, you know, how did you decide for this for your subjects? <laughs> um, well, they're all things that I like, but specifically kind of where that change took place was I was working on a book with a friend um, named uh, Noah Jackson. And while we were working, there were things that we both kind of wanted to explore in the book, but it wasn't going to quite fit in the series or, you know, often wouldn't uh, it would get voted down. And so during that time, I, I think it helped me realize all these things I really wanted to do. And because I couldn't do that, um, it made me even more eager. And so as soon as that book was done, I started making photos that were related to like Dungeons and Dragons. And then later on, just exploring all these other things that I naturally had interest in that um, I think I was also interested in it just because it felt maybe like wrong to do in the art community, <laughs> um, or at least in my school. It was like, you know, you can't take these comic book or Star Wars characters seriously as uh, they can't be conceptual and I wanted to push back against that. Maybe just to, I don't know, just to be controversial in that small way um, was enjoyable. <laughs> yeah. Good system. No, I mean, I, I love that idea that like there's, um, you know, I mean, I've been to art school, many people in this room have probably been to or are in art school, and there's some stuff that just feels like you just aren't allowed to bring it into the classroom in a critique space. And oftentimes it's like the things you love the most <laughs> that are like uh, just somehow like not taken seriously in an art context. And that's something that I really connected with about your work was like, you know, there, there's a lot of things to like about the photo, but I also, I just like that you clearly connect with the subject material, you know, that there are things from, like, I think what you watch is important, you know, even if it's not sort of quote unquote serious. Um, but Ernest, let's talk about you. Um, and maybe, maybe we'll sort of try to make some connections and see if they happen. I can already make some connections. If they, yeah, well why don't you, um, I'll sort of start with the same question. You have a lot of process happening, um, and uh, a lot of cyanotype, crocheting, music, um, a very sort of really sensory, uh, um, you know, in-depth sensory experience. In, in your beautiful installation. How did you get started working with all these materials? Yeah, I mean, well, so as you're, as you're speaking, I'm, I'm really curious about your motivation behind using these characters and drawn to just the fact that you like them. And so, because my process incorporates the things that essentially that I want or actually need to do. 
Um, so in, in what's up there now, um, this is an installation within a new series called New Love, and it's a continuation from um, an, another ongoing series called A Womb of My Own, and in parentheses, Mistakes Were Made in Development. And um, all of them are incorporating my, the things I normally do in real life to um, maintain my sanity, uh, to deal with anxiety, depression, um, to deal with emotions and to, and to you know, meditate. Um, so I've made my whole practice into a very conscious decision to make it something that's therapeutic. So I love to crochet. I've already been crocheting. And I started doing that actually in grad school and, and even thinking about like things that you're allowed to do um, or things that seem um, like, I guess, congruous to what an art context is. I went to a very photographic program and um, was really lucky to have mentors who just let us do whatever we wanted and encouraged us when we did things like bring in other materials. And so when I started this series and started this number of series, I had to think consciously of like, okay, what, is, what do I like to do? What do I need to do? And um, what actually would make sense in terms of making? And so uh, photography already is a way that I um, yeah, it's, it's a way that I process my feelings, process my emotions. It's a way that uh, I um, order the world. Like, I love the dark room. I love the order in a silver gelatin context. And, um, and the familiarity, familiarity there, the process. But I also enjoy just photographs in general, the feeling of taking a photograph. And also being instinctive about walking around and just what is it that I want to photograph and how do I want to do that and making and just kind of like making that into a, a real physical manifestation and so bringing in the crochet like what, what's in there is like a, a like a like a five to six year process of figuring out how does this all work together and so in the older series they're pretty disparate in a way they make sense to me I think they're all self portraits but um, it's becoming something more integrated because I've been working with them so long but there are already things that I was doing in my daily life that I'm bringing into my practice as it makes sense to me. Yeah. So. Well, on, on that note, tell me about the, the sounds we're hearing. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so the sound, like, and music is, there's like a double layer in my work. So, man, I make these blankets. They're not in there, but I make blankets that are with the songs that I sing. So if anyone knows how to crochet and just like a straight block of, squares you always start off with a foundation chain and then you add on to it it's pretty straightforward so what I do is I sing while I make the first chain and then I add on to it until it's my height so um, and then what is what's happened is that I've started improvising the stitches into photograms and um, oh my gosh am I supposed to be talking about the you asked me about the music what am I talking about it's okay <laughs> oh, and it's all connected <laughs> yeah oh yeah that's right it's all connected okay so that's the music part um, but the hums that you're hearing, I call them hums. They're sound pieces that um, are kind of like another way to, um, yeah, I make, I make these for myself. I, I make them to listen on the subway. I live in, I live in Brooklyn, um, and sometimes going outside is very, <laughs> very uh, anxiety provoking. And, um, and music is something that soothes me. So. I make music that I want to hear, and how I make my hums, every, every hum is around a certain chord, and whatever the chord is, that the, the key tone is a constant. So if it's, if it's in C major or if it's in G, there's always a C, there's always a G or a B flat. Um, and then I rotate the chords around that note, however it is I want, and I try to be as instinctual as possible with it. But every note I make is one long intonation. Like it's one full exhale to just kind of force myself to <laughs> be fun, like have fun with this and to make it relaxing because I do need rules sometimes to make sure that I don't um, make something harder than it needs to be or lose the enjoyment because that's again part of the process. I'm like, I want to, this is therapeutic. So sometimes I have to like shoehorn myself into being therapeutic. If that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, I guess, you know, maybe back to, to you, Jacob. Um, 
I know working on this show, we did, uh, well, well, two questions. I mean, one, you know, do you find you also have therapeutic aspects to art making and, and this practice in particular? Um, and I guess my other, you know, sort of thing that I was thinking was just to mention, we, you work with a lot of models, but you work with your family a lot. And I think when we edited this show together, we maybe just I selected um, entirely, you know, pictures that are you, your wife Evelyn, and your daughter Talia. Um, why is it? I mean, is it, you know, why is it important to you? Is it important to you that you're working with your with your family so much and yourself? So, for like the first part, talking about like the therapy and the work, um, I really like it as a show because I think she's achieved like a true, like I can sense there's like that therapy there and even going in the space is healing. And I, don't, I think I'm striving towards that. Although I think sometimes I'm sacrificing maybe therapy during my making for the therapy that comes in just from expressing and being able to, I found like, I guess when I was making the Batman work, I found that I was able to say, you know, that I was feeling sad. <laughs> in a way that other people like were able to engage with more than just telling people that I was feeling sad, um, which sometimes people don't know what to do with that. Um, but, but during making it, I wouldn't say it's always therapeutic. Sometimes it's pretty hectic or, <laughs> or even not fun, um, which is okay. But um, as far as like where I'm drawn to working with Evelyn and Talia, Part of it's, you know, practical as being a, a parent, being a young parent, um, where, you know, you're, I'm often up late at night working on these and those are the people that are around. But um, when Talia, or especially when it comes to Evelyn, but with Talia, um, I remember I didn't want to include her in the work at first just because I was maybe nervous about what my in-laws might think or even nervous that Talia would grow up and maybe not like it because sometimes you get self-conscious about um, playing, you know, being kid-like when you're growing up. But uh, the more that we've done it, um, the more that she's kind of let me know that she likes to do it, which has been really great. Um, when I was working on this newest series, I made a book last year called Did I Scare You? which is the yeah, idea was just my house is haunted or my apartment back then and uh, uh, a few months had gone by since the book had come out and Ty was like looking at it one day she's like I wish we could do that again <laughs> and I was really like shocked I was like oh man you actually really do enjoy this so see I think there's also it's just you know I think photos are for me or they represent just time you know, that time, and you can look at them, and for, with the series where we're working together, it's time where we spent together working on something, and, you know, for the most part, having fun together, which has been special, our own little family album. Um, I think, I think that's really, you know, it, it's so fascinating, just because knowing, you know, knowing those relationships, being expressed, you know, to me, seeing those relationships expressed through, like, these kind of pop culture uh, things is really, really funny, you know, and, like, and, and to me, I'm just like, what does it mean to portray yourself as Batman or your daughter as a little, like, demon figure on top of the counter? Um, and I really, uh, you'll notice we have uh, labels written around the walls from different members of the community responding to images, and they're all really fascinating to read, but there is one in particular is a conversation between Talia and Evelyn about the creation of the demon uh, on the <laughs> countertop picture, and it's adorable and really fun to read. Um, but one question I wanted to ask both of you, because I think there's a lot of, um, one commonality between the work that I was just thinking of was, there's a lot of crafting happening, um, you know, hand-making, hand-creating objects that are used in the work or used as the work. Um, I was wondering if you could both, you know, maybe share a little bit about that process, just like that how things were made. I know um, one, you know, one object I know you've talked about, Jacob, maybe you could start with is like the Batman cowl and, and just like what went into just like 
making that because you didn't go to the store and buy it. And then maybe, and as if you want to show the, you know, especially I think the cyanotype process. Yeah. Yeah, um, I definitely don't make everything by hand. Uh, <laughs> I buy a lot of stuff just on the internet, uh, but I do, I've been trying more and more to make things by hand. I've been making a lot more masks, but yeah, the Batman mask was probably one of the first masks I made. And I was kind of trying to figure out how I wanted to make it, because I knew I wanted, I wanted to just use house paint and I wanted to layer that house paint in a way that would, I don't know, feel handmade, but also have like this really nice smooth quality to it, um, like combining those two. But I actually looked up an instructable is how I looked, figured out how I was gonna do it. Um, and somebody was like, this is the easiest way to make a mask. Can you take a grocery bag, and you put it on your head, <laughs> you cut out like a mouth hole and eye holes, and then you slowly layer tape on it oh, yeah. and then yeah from there it was a couple pieces of poster board and and then just lots and lots of house paint from Lowe's. So. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Yeah I mean I don't I really love craft period and most of it started with the crochet um, just making different uh, just different patterns and seeing things come together. I like projects <laughs> where I used to make a lot of hats for, for friends. Um, and I also taught myself how to sew, but I think it also, it's just a matter of me just being very curious. I used to get into a lot of things when I was little and um, like I like learning new things because I, I'm very nosy and sometimes I feel like, oh, if I don't know how to do something, then at least give it a try and figure out how it works, the in and outs of it. Um, there are certain things that are just very interesting to me. And with cyanotype in particular, I'm just looking at the inflation look at you guys. But the, the, the cyanotypes in particular, um, they're, they're very mysterious. And I think the process is a lot more surprising than I expected it to be. And so that's what I'm dealing with right now with those pieces. Uh, they're not as straightforward as silver gelatin prints that I'm um, also playing around with that have also been quite surprising. But in, um, I honestly thought that I could make self-portraits with cyanotype in a similar manner as I've been making self-portraits with silver gelatin. And I, I can, but there are certain decisions that I'm making that um, will keep them from looking like the latent figure of my body underneath. So there's a latent figure there, but just because of how I'm working with cyanotype, I don't think I'll ever get um, like a, a, a figurative object or, or a, 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 what do you call it, a contact print of my body. Um, so so that's, those are the things I really enjoy about the materials and photography in general, because it is so mysterious and um, at the same time scientific, so there are things about it that I understand that I get. Um, there are, uh, you know, chemistries that are, are very fascinating to me, but then there's also that wonder about just working with something, um, a physical object, and seeing it, how it changes, and just being okay with not understanding it. Um, I have asked <laughs> um, a mentor who is just, like a really wonderful person who works with Cyanotype and has been working with it for years and I'm like why is it doing this and she's like I don't know and and her response to that being I don't know and if that's okay gives me permission to be okay with it too but to just really enjoy what happens when you attempt something and I, I think it, especially with like all I can think about is um, use how you're using stretch material and do you use stretch material on expand it? Mm -hmm. Okay, sorry, because that was one of my questions. That's really hard. Yes. <laughs> so, so even <laughs> things like that, I think it's really fun to um, to even know that to, to just understand how materials work, and it also gives me um, an idea of what I can do next, and leaves me open to other things that I don't think I would have been able to figure out if I hadn't been working um, with something physically. So I have a hard time with digital photography, period, for yeah. these reasons. <laughs> okay.
Well, I, you know, I guess, you know, on that note, one of the things I was, I was just thinking about, and I think you started talking about this in a couple of different places, and I think maybe this is something that comes up for Jacob too, but in your work I was thinking about your relationship to the body and in the, in the sense that it's like a very tactile space. Mm-hmm. It's very like safe feeling space. I think Jacob said healing, and I think it feels really <laughs> healing. And um, yeah, I was just wondering, like, I don't know, I, I felt like earlier today I was in this room and I was like, I can feel my whole body in here in a way, or like I became very aware of it in a way that felt really nice. You know, like, and I, I think in general, I think of photography as like a disembodied thing, or, you know, can be very disembodied. It's very like much the eye and the head. And, yeah, you know, yeah. But I was just wondering, you know, is that something you're thinking about while you're making? And also, who are you wearing? Oh, <laughs> uh, well, okay, first of all, the body is part of my mind. Goes. Okay, um, I do think about that, but I make the installations based off of how I feel about it, which is very different from how I have worked prior to doing work like this. And so, um, because I think. I think you've mentioned this before, but just um, for me, um, feeling my body and, and being aware of my emotions is not easy. Um, it is something that I have to work very hard to do. And so um, working instinctually or even uh, incorporating other things that don't have uh, a preconceived idea, for instance, like it, um, improvising the crochet and even the, the music, like making the hums, um, I make sure that I don't come to crafting those pieces with an idea. I'm just like, what do you feel like hearing next? And it's hard, but it's also an ongoing exercise um, all the time. And I and I, I wonder about you feeling your body because it is it's it's sensory on purpose. So it's visual, it's text textural, um, like very haptic, and even the the way I make my hums, like, so I love textural music. So on purpose, there's a lot of layering in, in, in the sound pieces. Um, there's a lot of movement and dynamics, so um, soft and, and very loud. And um, sometimes when I'm recording, it's my just my voice layer on top of each other. I'll walk away from the microphone. Um, I'll record in different acoustics just to kind of get a different sound. And um, I'm very particular with, with how things sound. So. This is all about pleasing myself first and being okay with that. And so, like, whenever I put up something like this, I'm just hoping that people feel something. And I, I don't ever try to evoke anything out of anyone but myself and just hope that other people kind of connect with it. So, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and I, I made this. This is just like a white dress. Um, okay, so I'm going to ask Jacob one more question, and then I'm going to open it up to anyone to ask a question, so maybe start thinking of your questions. Um, but one of the things I, you know, one of the things that was really interesting working with you, Jacob, and I, I wrote about this a little bit in the essay, and there's, there's two gallery guides, Kate Kelly wrote a really wonderful essay about Ernest's work, and I wrote a passable essay about Jacob's work. And, uh, <laughs> Um, but one of the things, you know, one of the places our conversation went, you mentioned you went to BMU, BYU, you were raised in the Mormon church. Um, and we had a good conversation about kind of entertainments that were acceptable and not acceptable uh, growing up. And, you know, for your parents, for your community, for your religion, like whatever. And one of the things you mentioned was that Nine Num, the Star Wars picture being... <laughs> One of the first pictures you did with Talia, I think an early picture, and you had mentioned um, that Star Wars was actually like on the list of like approved entertainment, and I thought that was really interesting, and the reason it was really interesting. I was wondering if you could talk about that a little yeah. bit. Yeah, um, before I answer your question, I just want to say that the essay I think was really good. <laughs> I, was, I was really moved when I read it. Um, Thank you. It felt really nice to feel that understood on a level, so thank you. Um, yeah, as David said, I grew up uh, Mormon. I'm formally Mormon now, but um, there was a lot of overlap, at least I saw in those movies, and, I, and even as I transitioned from that faith, I realized that 
kind of the things I believed about Star Wars, I still believe, <laughs> but I don't believe maybe in a higher power anymore, but this idea of maybe this force, this good energy that can guide us to make, uh, make good choices, I still believe that maybe that we can feel that. And that was one of them. Another one was, uh, you know, in the, in the Mormon church, there's a strong belief in an afterlife and in uh, uh, beings that, you know, appear and communicate with you. And maybe even at your ancestors will communicate with you from beyond the grave. And that's something that you see in Star Wars happen over and over with, you know, only the Jedi get to do it in Star Wars, which is kind of lame. <laughs> maybe a little cooler than Mormonism, that one thing. But, uh, <laughs> But yeah, I think um, I think there's probably overlap for Star Wars with a lot of you know faiths because it it's uh, yeah it's about this unseen power that can guide you and uh, that you can even draw power from. Yeah. So. Yeah, and I, I mean I just love I love how your work makes me think about all these stories that we're kind of familiar with and in the way that um, we can make so many of these stories our own, right? Or you know, we just use them for the things we need to use them for, and that's such a human thing, but you sort of just take them to this next level of really just, you know, use the people of your home and your family and everything like that, just you know, making it your own story, which, which is really beautiful. Um, so with that, does anyone have any questions for our esteemed artists, or do esteemed artists have any questions for each other? Um, yeah, Jacob, I, when I was looking at the work, <laughs> I thought it really interesting how you're kind of going from this like uh, home setting to this very fan to these very fantasy settings right next to each other. Um, you know, I'm kind of picturing like, is there, you know, a dresser behind the two, <laughs> um, whatever, uh, or behind the Spider-Man uh, mm -hmm. somewhere? So I guess I'm in my head to picturing your family taking part in this process with you. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering, you know, when you're making the work, are you already envisioning um, these sort of fantasy backgrounds or foregrounds as you're making it, or are those things that come later in the editing process? Um, yeah, so, good question. Um, so the ones that don't have a background, or are, my background is my living space, is that I, I kind of work in, in my mind in like different series and that kind of helps me to separate the work and to focus on a project or a theme or even or a character or a world and so those ones with, that are more fanta fantastical or in an imaginary world that was kind of how I was working first and then I started the series where I was like what if I could just take like an element of like kind of something that's extraordinary and just put it just in my house or my apartment at the time, which the apartment we lived in when I started it, I thought was really ugly. <laughs> and so I wanted to fight the house, kind of like activate this really um, like weird apartment with uh, these fun creatures. But yeah, the, 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 the ones that have more, just a non-ordinary background, I, I, for the most part, will draw out and um, most of the time we'll color and sketch out kind of a, a study before I begin work on the photo. Yeah. I would also add, uh, Jacob and I did an online studio visit uh, way back early in the pandemic, but on that video we included a lot of slides of Jacob's planning drawings of these, and they're just fucking fantastic. They're so <laughs> cool. <laughs> so. Look that up on our YouTube page. I have a, I have a question for you guys. Oh. Um, I really enjoy your show, Recap, Recapitulation. Yeah. <laughs> it's a big word for me. But uh, <laughs> um, I especially like kind of like when we were talking about bodies and filling your body. Mm -hmm. I thought there's a space like that's kind of a corner where there isn't an object. And I, really like that space because of that reason. It makes you really aware of, you know, 
I don't know, oftentimes when you're in a gallery, it is similar to a digital space where it's, you're presented with a scroll of imagery or objects. Mm -hmm. And I felt like because that like is interrupted by that kind of serpentine uh, fabric that you've made, I thought it makes you aware that you're in a space which makes you aware of your body. But um, my question for you was about kind of how you came to this place. You talked about how it's different than the work in the past that you're used to making mm -hmm. and kind of like what created that shift or maybe um, like influenced you to make that shift to this work that's purely um, therapeutic and almost like what you want. Because I feel like that's something I'm striving for and talking with my friends about is like trying to make work regardless of if the work's going to be good or not or even if it's going to be effective or not but just like making it because I need to make it yeah so I was wondering if you talk about that a little bit yeah and I'm interested in because I, I listened to your studio visits okay. and you did mention something about this as kind of like a conduit for feelings yeah. so sad Batman Definitely. and and I can really relate to, um, well, that's, I use my work as a conduit for, for feelings also. Sort of like a, um, it, yeah, it's a, whole, it's a whole process and it's mirroring what I'm doing in my, my real life. But um, yeah, no, I had, I call it an acute traumatic situation that um, forced me to reevaluate a lot of things that I've been struggling with, like emotions. Like I like to just, I used to describe myself as someone who's very cold. And emotionless, um, but I wasn't. I just didn't understand my own emotions because um, I grew up in a very chaotic environment where um, my own emotions, it's almost, it was almost uh, in order to survive that I had to be very controlled. Yeah, um, suppress it. Yeah, suppress it very, 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 yeah. Um, I also grew up in a religious um, environment, I grew up in the African Methodist Episcopal Church. Um, which is not very uh, structured or strict, or strict, mm -hmm. but in terms of like a culture, was it definitely also was something that really influenced me. Um, and and growing up on like the other side of you know like like I guess the Protestant or whatever, like this idea of self denial and um, and always wanting to hone into this higher power yeah. and uh, and essentially uh, demeaning your own impulses and proclivities and wants and needs and desires and as that being inherently bad and so um, so so I so that was an influence but also just sort of like uh, just in general like the my home environment is very much um, not about I could not spend a lot of time on my emotions so I'll just say that also so in, in grad school grad school was very hard for me because I went to a school that focused on emotions mm. and so um, they if there it was all about like what are you feeling what do you want to do and I'm just like why are we talking about this I just came here to do this project and, and digging into the psychology of a process was something that I did not expect and my um, my background is in biology and not that I'm like a super scientific person but I knew that the transition when I decided to be a photographer I knew the transition would be difficult because I'm going from a very objective environment to something that's more subjective. But I didn't realize that in that subjectivity, there's also so many decisions that are up to me now, and um, and so many things that are just not as black and white or good or bad. It's just it just is. So getting used to that was was very difficult. But black and white silver gelatin photography was a way for me to. Um, to use my my hyper type A ness, I'll say that I developed as a kid, and and being someone who's very much into order, so like church order, structure, just knowing what's good and bad, what's right and wrong, making the perfect print was something that I wanted to achieve and accomplish, and brought me great joy. But it also was a part of how I was structuring my life around not being able to feel these emotions and just surviving in an environment where emotions were actually kind of dangerous. So when this acute thing happened, I just started questioning all these things that a lot came up in grad school where people were like, oh, you're, it looks like you want to tell us something, but you're obscuring a lot from us. It looks like you're showing, but you're actually hiding. And I think that kind of transparency in, in, in the art context was terrifying to me, where I, I, people were seeing things that I wasn't seeing. And this whole way of working was an attempt to 
work on myself and to confront that and purposefully do things that um, were in a response to emotions and feelings. <laughs> just like, what's it? Okay, what's in there? Um, because it got to a point where I needed to do that in order to just like get through the day. Um, and so I honestly started making all of my work without thinking anyone would care um, or would notice. And and started off with my my photograms where people were like, oh, can we show those? And I those everything was made within the context of this is a personal exercise that I need in order to uh, discover who I am. <laughs> Essentially, like who who am I? was a central question that I realized, you know, relatively late that I didn't know the answer to. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Cool. Do you relate to that at all? Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Um, yeah, just this, I feel like for me in these past few years, like, coming to terms with, you know, I, I came from a you know, religion that kind of has an answer for everything almost. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, this is because of this. And, if you do this, you'll go here, and then kind of leaving that behind, and then realizing that you kind of get to decide what to believe, but that's really hard. <laughs> but um, that sounds really cool, too, to go somewhere where they were thinking about emotions, because I think photographs are really emotional and really sentimental and nostalgic, like all these things that stir the emotional pot within us like to the max. <laughs> And um, I think that's great. But uh, yeah, I think, I don't know, like sometimes I feel like work, like doing it as work, like I, I love that you said you started working on yours just kind of for yourself, mm. which I think is really beautiful because I think sometimes like when, you, when I'm working on it, like and having been working in the art community for so long, I am thinking about what are people going to think about this? Or especially just being in a family unit, like what is my wife or what is her family gonna think about this? And it makes it hard to let it just like, you know, to, to make that decision just for me, I guess sometimes. Yeah. But yeah, I remember listening to, I was listening to one of your talks and you talked about the, I think it was the, the photograms, the grids that you lay on. Mm -hmm and talking about how you don't have to lay there for as long as you do, but you lay there longer just because you need to. Mm -hmm. And I related to that because I was thinking about how sometimes it's, you make the photo so you can do this one thing, you know, like, and for me, sometimes it's just to like role play, you know, it's like to be this like fun jetpack man for a little <laughs> bit, you yeah. know, or to like make a photo where it's just like, I'm just going to jump up real quick. Yeah. Um, like this idea of like the action and the desire preceding the object that you're trying to make, I definitely relate to that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's something that stood out in your uh, the studio visit that you guys did. Um, because, and also just hearing about your work too, um, in terms of how you work with your family. And because um, and I, I, I also just see a lot of relation in your work. And, um, and it's probably really explicit, but just it, this, this feels like a way of um, just being with one another and, and coming through um, in, in a way, like just sort of using photography as an excuse to do these really amazingly fun things and to learn and to also get to do that kind of perhaps um, rebellious uh, yeah. stuff from growing up. Yeah. And um, and I and I yeah and I, I also wonder about that too. Um, I mean, I just just have to say like I this is probably my favorite photograph of I don't even know the name of the character but it, the Star Wars like your Nine Num Nine Num yes I don't know any of <laughs> the names. It's a tricky one. Yeah. I'm <laughs> um, yeah, because like I uh, I I am drawn to for the friends is also Marvel like I'm going through a Marvel moment trying to understand. The order of the movies but the thing that i, I love about them the most are uh, the music and some of them and particularly um, i was talking to, to kate about this the loki soundtrack i'm obsessed with the loki soundtrack and um star wars the uh, I, I i think i've watched that the third movie um episode six over and over and over again when i was a kid thinking that it was the only one. Oh, that was, and then when that I, was really interesting. Yeah, and then I realized, oh no, there are two other ones, and 
um, would, would watch them all the way to the end, mostly to get to the music at the end, and oh, just, yeah. you know, would play, conduct, everything, and just sort of those obsessions with, uh, just like a, like a, the world building that's able to, to do for you, but also how it, um, that, that's what it evokes in me, in, in looking at that image, but seeing how you're playing with it, um, with your, with your family, in, like, as an adult, but very, in a childlike, playful, imaginative manner, um, I think it's, it's, it's just a really wonderful way of kind of indulging in those things. Um, yeah, that's just a comment. I don't know if you want to <laughs> say anything about it. Uh, yeah, sure. I just want to say that sounds like a really cool way to experience Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And also the music at the end of that one's so great because it has like the Ewok celebration. Oh yeah. Just kind of had a big dance party at the end. Yeah. Love that. But uh, <laughs> yeah, I think like for this this photo of my num is it's a recreation of an actual photo that my wife took where we were celebrating Star Wars Day. And we were all dressed up and I was pushing my daughter in a stroller and that was the first time I was like, I'm just gonna remake this one because <laughs> I like it so much. I need another one. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, and my first solo show of my work was on May the Fourth, oh, cool. <laughs> 2018, and so I was like, I didn't tell anyone that. I was like, this is a significant day. It's on May the Fourth, <laughs> but just you know, just for personal reasons, anyway. Yeah. But yeah, that's, I love that story. It's great. Um, anyone else? Marcel. Oh my God. Right. <laughs> Getting really good at the top half to the faces. That was impressive. Last time I saw you, I got hair, so that was good. <laughs> so, listening to the two of you talk, I feel like now I got a connection with both of you, so I guess I'll ask two questions real fast. So, Kernesh, mm -hmm. I love hearing you talk about these, the music and these soundtracks, especially because I'm all about soundtracks and stuff too. Yeah. Do you have, so I'm asking you, do you have any favorite? Composers, oh, yes. and you know, because I'm like people know I've, I've fought people about John Williams. So I know. <laughs> why would you fight about John Williams? Because I love him, and people mm -hmm. have said things that just don't set right. So. <laughs> yeah, no, I. I love John Williams. <laughs> I there's so many things wrapped up in that. Um, oh God, like the, the so the title to my show is very very important. Um, and so many things, because recapitulation is um, a musical term um, that it's a part of a symphony that returns to the main motif and the theme after a series of, of developments. Um, my God, like John, John Williams, I, I, growing up, I wanted to be specifically the first chair tenor saxophonist because I knew that he conducted the Boston Pops in the summer. And growing up, I played in, I you know, played piano, grew up playing music, so piano and like clarinet, but I love the, the saxophone and I love playing jazz. And I thought, well, I love John Williams and I want to play in, the, um, in, a, in a group that he conducts, but how can I do that with the instrument I'm playing? And I remember seeing on TV during July 4th, like, because they always play at the, like, the Hatch in Boston, and I saw a saxophone and I was like, oh, okay, so that's how I'll do it. Um, but I'll say that I was discouraged from doing it because you know, I was just kind of trapped into science. And so John Williams is, I, I, think about, I think about him all the time because you know, I'm, I'm, I'm past the age, or I've gone through the age where I've seen people who are playing, um, who are performing Star Wars um, scores, and I'm like, I could, I, I could have been there. And I, it, it's, I'm always dealing with them, like, it's okay. You're okay where you are now, it's okay. But, um, but yeah, so I, so I, uh, right now I'm obsessed with Anton Bruckner, who was deeply influenced by Beethoven, who I'm also obsessed with. I love, love, love Beethoven. Um, and, and so, uh, and also just in terms of the, I just shout out the Loki soundtrack. Um, I can't remember the, uh, her name, the composer's name, but yeah, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a very moving, show and I and I think the music is also incredibly moving as well and layered and um, and deep and there's also like a you know like a, a Wagner reference um, with that also kind of pulls in so much history and that's what I really like about um, about music that also um, 
you know, good music, music that I like. I'll just say music that I like. So, and but I, it, it spans, it, it ranges. Uh, my influences are also um, in gospel music growing up. So those are the good things about church. Like I, I still, to this day, am obsessed with Richard Smallwood, who I think is probably the best <laughs> gospel music artist. Um, and, and yeah, so, so it's pretty much off the top of my head who right now I'm, I'm really, really fixated on, but just it just runs the gamut, yeah. And John Williams, like, well, whatever, yeah. Well, <laughs> no, I just want to talk to you forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jacob, some of your characters that I see, the, 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 I, the, the most well-known ones, let me, I'm just curious, like, what is your relationship with some of these characters? When I first saw some of your images, um, of all the ones that struck me, it was uh, the Power Rangers, just because I used to teach kids, and I remember one young man who was obsessed <laughs> This is like the nineties, but it was—I was fascinated. Cause I was too old to be into them, but I—it was amazing watching this little person be so into them. I'm just curious what your relationship with this. Do you do you pick subjects sometimes that are just—they're there, they're popular. But do you maybe don't have the same relationship with them, or do they, you have relationships with them all? Yeah, um, I definitely have a relationship with the character before I want to make a image with them, and I think. What really motivates me towards certain characters lately is me and my daughter. We're, we're just, you know, we're watching these, these shows together for her first time a lot of times. And, and uh, it gets, I don't know, now that I'm an adult coming back to these things, I'm just sitting there, you know, I don't have to pay as close attention to the story. So I'm thinking a lot about the character and maybe how I relate. But I think, too, kind of what you were saying touches on it, too, like these. These characters and these myths, um, they are ours. They belong to us. And that's why I think, you know, we, people like the, the student you had obsess over them, um, myself included. But I think, yeah, I think they're kind of made to be that. They're kind of crafted to be these characters that you can kind of like slip that shoe on. Like for, for me, like for, for Batman, um, I, you know, sometimes I get in arguments with my friend who's more team Superman, and, and I have to agree, like, Superman's probably a better person, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I think that's why a lot of us are drawn to Batman, because he is mentally ill, like what, what many of us are, <laughs> and, um, and maybe there's that fantasy where he gets to, like, go have therapy in this, this way that none of us can. <laughs> <laughs> Even though he has access to like probably really great therapy. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, like a character I'm kind of brewing with right now. I just started on the Spider Man series, but I've been brewing on Darth Maul, who's this character that's. I like minor characters because I think there's so much room to explore with them, like with Nine Numb. But like. I like Darth Maul like right now because you get to explore this idea of like this character who was nothing but ambition and was cut short in the most extreme way and I want to explore that um, with experiences that I've had and you know like he had this he only had this like one relationship you know with this mentor figure that completely discards him and I think it's really tragic. Um, and so I'm drawn to characters like that. Um, that I guess there's still a lot to be written about them, but also, also the big characters are fun to play with too because they've they've been around so long that they are so they're, I feel like they're really pliable at this point. Because um, if they aren't, if they can't be pliable, then they're they're not going to last much longer for us. I want to say thank you all so much for coming, and I want to say thank you, Jacob and Ernest, so much for sharing so much of yourselves and your work in this conversation. I really loved it. Thank you.